Hello. We will talk about localization today. This lecture is somewhat the second phase of the course. We covered the state estimation topics in the first 10 lectures. We laid out several algorithms that today you will see that we can apply them to a problem that we will face in robotics and we will look, we will, look, we will be looking after methods to solve the problem that we, we want to discuss what we can do and how we can apply the knowledge we gained so far to this particular problem. This is a topic of localization. After that, we will study mapping, and then we will study how to do both of them at the same time, simultaneous localization and mapping as well. So localization is one of the fundamental problems in robotics. Because if the robot doesn't know where it is located, in a lot of practical problems, it's almost inefficient or impractical to plan. Usually, there's a need for some sort of localization. Whether it's relative, local, or global, we need some knowledge of robot location to plan and act based on that. For example, if you want to grab an object, you might need to know the relative position of that object with respect to that arm that is going to grab it. If you know it perfectly, then, it's hot, then it makes it so much easier to reach out. If you know it with some small uncertainty, then still you can plan and grab the object. If you want to navigate from point A to B, if you know where you are and you will be able to know where you will be at any time in the future, you just plan, maybe avoid obstacles, and stop when you reach the destination. So this is a very important and old problem. The setup in localization is such that, that we are given a map of the environment. We have perfect knowledge of the environment in some ways. Based on how you know the environment and how you model it, we might need to use different algorithms. But as a very abstract idea, a map, which is a representation of surrounding of the robot, we have that knowledge. Then we have a sequence of measurements, data. The robot moves, maybe we collect data from motion of the robot, but also we can collect a sequence of data from cameras, LiDAR, rangefinders, maybe radar, Wi-Fi signals, any sort of data that comes sequentially to the robot, and we might leverage that for state estimation. So the overall problem is that we collect some sort of data as we move, and we want to solve an inference problem, which is finding the location of the robot. We're going to look into state estimation algorithms which estimation is one aspect of inference. So typically you have data, you want to infer quantity. State estimation algorithms are one way of doing that and they're very efficient. Why they're attractive? Because we're gonna see this fits well into that base framework formula. Data comes sequentially, we can run the filter recursively, we don't need to store the entire history, and we can track the robot location. So it makes them very attractive for a lot of robotics application because data arrives sequentially and we wish to estimate some quantities. Here, the robot position and heading. So pose is the combination of position, location, like X, Y, Z, and heading, orientation. So when we say pose, we mean position and orientation. But sometimes we informally say position, we mean maybe both. So what are the problems? One problem is tracking. If we want to know at any time where we are, then we need to track. Another problem is that if we don't know where we are in the beginning, then we have to solve a problem called global localization. 
which is a bigger challenge because that initial condition that we said we assume is given in, a, in an algorithm like a Kalman filter, well, that corresponds to where we are initially. What if we don't know that? So then that becomes an important problem that we call it global localization because we want to search globally where we are. What if we know where we are and we're tracking and then maybe for some reason the robot loses the tracking or we lift the robot and put it somewhere else or for any reason the algorithm is interrupted and then we want to recover again. This is typically called the kidnap robot problem. So tracking, global localization, and recovery when the localization is somehow interrupted. Now, this is a setup for the localization problem that we want to talk about. For example, here you see an image of robot dogs. These are little dogs made by Sonny. Used to be in Robocop. There was a leak. They play football and compete. Later, it was replaced by now humanoid robot. There's a little humanoid robot, bipedal robot. They, they play soccer in a team. And I used to work in a team as an undergrad and later master's student in Robocop. First rescue robot league and then the next generation of this. But the problem appeared here, right? So you want a bunch of robot move in this field and they need to score goals. Now maybe you, there's a lot of, there are a lot of problems to coordinate, maybe pass the ball, detect the ball, track the ball, shoot, detect on players, the opposite side, they take your own goal, the other side, you don't want to score on goal, that's obviously not going to help anybody in the team. So, now the, if you make it look to be similar to a human soccer field, it's very difficult because around the field there are people, there are ads, there are a lot of distractions. There are uh, photographers and a lot of people. And then the goals from both sides are identical. There's a net, there are white posts. And the field is also symmetric because both sides are similar, which is a problem. If you're getting observations and you're in a symmetrical environment, how, how the algorithm is supposed to know which side is correct because both sides are correct. They agree with the data. So they simplify the problem. How about we add some landmarks with different pattern. If the camera can detect them, now we have landmarks with unique IDs. You can name it. Maybe in your map, in your code, you say one, two, three, so on. Now, you need a computer vision algorithm to detect this post and maybe analyze the color and then tell you, well, the green is up and pink is at the bottom and then maybe this from what I coded, this is landmark number one. And because the number of landmarks are limited, maybe six, then you can search exhaustively even. That's fine. Which is not as scalable if you're dealing with thousands of landmarks. You need better algorithms. So you, and you know the dimension of the map, right? The, the documents of the competition will tell you the exact dimensions of maybe size of this, the lines. So you know the layout of the field. You know the size. So even if you have a monocular camera and you detect lines and the field, you can match it to a model which is very helpful. So we know the environment, and clearly the environment here is in form of landmarks, because seeing 
just the plain field in the middle or moving objects doesn't seem to be very helpful for localizing ourselves with respect to fixed references, landmarks, okay? For example, if you set this point to be your zero, zero, right? Then you localize everything with respect to some frames here. And you know exact location of your landmark. This is x3, y3, or x1, y1. It's clear to see. So you know the map. As long as you can detect these landmarks online, and you can get some sort of measurement. For example, the robot needs to know that what is the range, and if this is the heading of the robot, what is this range and angle? If you can get the range and bearing, that's a lot of information. And if you somehow can track the robot motion, maybe from legs, maybe from IMU, Maybe if you don't have any sense or some assumption, then this is similar to running prediction correction, prediction correction. Sounds like we can use any of the filters we studied. So each robot can run a self-localization algorithm in the field. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, do we store a belief of the other landmarks and then do something akin to turning your head and locating the other and updating that belief? So, your question is if we detect two more than one landmark at the same time, what do we do? Yeah, we can't detect all of the landmarks at the same time, so we can't use all the information at the same time. The field of view of the camera is limited. Now, this is not dependent on the algorithm, this is the technicality of when you actually deal with a particular setup that is given. In this example, the camera has a limited field of view, so it is not possible to see the entire field at any time. And the landmark, maybe your algorithm can detect this one, right? Maybe not, maybe it's too far. So it depends, let's say you can. Let's say these days you have a deep neural network and it will nail, nail it down for you, right? Range and bearing of all the landmarks. It's just possible, you can do it. So then run sequential or batch update. That was in the homework. So that was the objective of the homework that you had an object, you had, you had two cameras and you implemented two or three filters, and the problem was that should we use sequential updates or batch updates? Both are possible. It's not like any of them is wrong. Batch is better because you're using the entire information at one time to correct the state. Whereas if you do sequential updates, when you update the first time, the second time the linearization point is changed. Depending if that's, that's a better realize, the linearization point or worse, it can go either way. Whereas batch will help you to incorporate all the information at once and then you're done. So it's ideally you do batch update. Maybe, in this case. That would also be considered the angle in that. Yeah, so you can zoom out, zoom in and out as much as you want, right, in a particular setup. Maybe I put the dog on a car as well, so then <laughs> you can go infinite levels of <laughs> nested mechanism to make it complicated. But, but the idea is that there is a way to get these constraints, relative measurements, which is important, that's the part that you need to process signals. There's a signal processing part and you get measurements. So we are not so much concerned about the signal processing part, although we talk about it a little bit. We assume somehow we can get the measurements. And 
because for different problems, we should look into it how we should do that. That means that our landmark number is going to be more than our variables. So, is there any minimum requirement? The question is Is there minimum number of landmarks for this problem that we should observe? And the answer is yes, you need a minimum number of landmarks to make your state observable. That's why we had the observability analysis in the invariant extended Kalman filter lecture when we showed that when you only observe one landmark, range and bearing xy, and your state is position and heading, it will not make the orientation observable. So you need at least two landmarks at any time to run a correction that will make your entire state observable. Now when the filters are nonlinear, it's not that trivial to run observability analysis. You can do local observability analysis, but that also very complicated. You need to take the derivative of vector fields, lead derivative of these process models and measurement models and look into that, and that, that is only valid locally. It's not globally. So it's very difficult, and that's why you don't see it a lot in robotics literature, because it's nonlinear anyway. Whereas Working with the exponential coordinates provided a setup that at least in an ideal case we see if it makes the state observable or not because we had linear error models. So it is important, generally the more the better, assuming your information processing method, your state estimator, your inference method is consistent and it will not you know, use data to make it worse. If it's mathematically sound, information cannot hurt. It makes it better. Now, in practice, you might have outliers and all sort of things that maybe your algorithm is not designed to deal with that. So there's a theoretical side and practical side to it. But theoretically, the more information, the better the estimate. So again, that becomes case by case. What is your state? Maybe it's good for 2D. Maybe the same measurement is not good if you want to estimate a 3D pose. So we need to look into it case by case. So this is the localization setup and problem. It can be any mobile robot moving maybe in this building or inside a building. If you can detect landmarks, for example, April tags are very famous and popular, developed here in Michigan by Professor Ed Olson. Those tags, you can print them and attach them to the walls, and the camera can detect the tag, can decode the ID of the tag, and using a single image can also tell you the relative pose of the landmark. And there's a LiDAR tag version of that developed here by one of our PhD students in Michigan, Bruce Hunk. He made a li LiDAR tag version of that. You detect that tag in a LiDAR in 3D, it'll decode it for you, and it will give you a relative pose. So if you put a bunch of these tags around the environment, you can basically solve localization. Now, it is more exciting not to do that, but it is a solution. Maybe you want it for maybe a room that you can calibrate, or maybe a building for a particular service that, that solves the problem and it's not very invasive. It can be a good solution depending on the application. But adding all those tags on highway in the entire country it doesn't sound like a <laughs> compelling idea. And then people go around, kick the tags, you have to continuously maintain the infrastructure as well. So, that's. so name four methods to solve this problem before we move on. At least four methods. Like a filtering equation, so to speak? 
Well, based on what I described, call for ideas, methods that we learned so far, and we can solve this problem. Otherwise, I will end the lecture here, <laughs> because we need to go back and <laughs> talk about previous topics again. <laughs> The linear Kalman filter? Not the linear Kalman filter, yeah, the EKF. Yeah. EKF. So EKF, extended Kalman filter, UKF, unscented Kalman filter. You said particle filter. Invariant extended Kalman filter. So at least we have four methods to solve this. Is there any other way? Oh yeah, all sorts of EKFs you can do. <laughs> Beyond that, is there any other idea? Base filter. Base filter, but these are all implementation of base filter. We can also use least squares, nonlinear least squares to solve this problem. You can do it offline as a batch, or that's not good enough. We want to do it incrementally. And that's what we will learn in a SLAM, because in a SLAM, the filtering is more specific when we keep the history and look at it in the structure of linearized, um, basically, least squares or even graphical model. It possesses a particular structure that is sparse, and it's interesting. So when we solve a SLAM, we look into least squares formulation. Now, we know already that you verify it in your homeworks that in the linear case, the linear Kalman filter and least squares are the same. And the linear Kalman filter and map estimation, maximum of posteriori estimation using two Gaussians, also is the same. So they're equivalent. However, least squares problem is much more general than a Kalman filtering. And when the problem is nonlinear, this equivalence is not so trivial, because you don't get the same answer. So we could do recursive least squares. Or we will learn an idea called incremental smoothing and mapping, ISAM, that is also applicable to this problem. So when we learn the SLAM later, that doesn't mean that we cannot solve localization problem. Of course we can. That's just the special version of Slam, part of the information map is given. So at this point, you are not so much concerned about the tools we will use. Rather, you, you are concerned about the problem and the setup. And then you choose the right tool to solve the problem. We can talk about the extended Kalman filter, depending on the motion model, which you can separate in your implementation, the way we implemented in the examples and homework is that you can have an abstraction that you have an extended Kalman filter class that takes the model as the input. So you can change the model. It's not tied to a particular Jacobian or motion model that you might see. This is just an example. Same thing for other methods and filters. Now suppose there is a particular motion model that works with x, y, theta, position, and heading. This is a notation now in probabilistic robotics book because the slides match chapter seven and eight of probabilistic robotics book. So the motion model is called G. It's Jacobian capital G with respect to the state X. Because the noise is multiplicative, there is a Jacobian with respect to noise. But because the noise is added to the input in the formulation in the book, the book is taking the derivative with respect to the input. You get the same answer if you take the derivative with respect to noise, because it's assumed it is the input that is noisy which doesn't make any difference. This will give you the same thing as 
Now this is noise. So you can assume the input is noisy and take the derivative with respect to the input. Again, gives the same result as the derivative with respect to the noise. Now something, you can do clever things like this. Maybe your motion noise covariance is not a static. Maybe the faster you move and turn, these variances should be higher with some up to tuning coefficients. So one idea is, it is heuristic, it's not coming from any particular principle as far as I know, but it is a good idea because you're saying that if I, my variance for the input, which this is for a differential wheel robot, it can move forward and it can turn, right? So the inputs are moving forward and turning. So you need a two by two covariance. The idea is that if you move faster, the variances will be higher with some linear combination of these two. So in the prediction step, we calculate the predicted state and then we update the covariance. Now because we have multiplicative noise, the Jacobian of the motion model with respect to the noise or the input here is not the identity, so we get this Vm times V transpose. This is the same familiar Kalman filtering prediction step. So you don't really need to be worried about the Kalman filtering part, this is, that's the same, you need to be worried about the model part. What is your mo motion model? What is your sensor? Yeah, alpha one, alpha four, tunable parameters, user defined parameters. Maybe your vehicle is, you know, big, small, depending how it moves, maybe you need to tune them, if you're going to choose this model. Maybe you choose a constant and you get the same answer too. Depends on the problem, so you need to look into it. Then we also get maybe range and bearing relative angle measurements. Now, after the signal processing part is done, we're left with some geometric constraints, and that's the range and relative angle of the landmark uh, with respect to where the robot is observing that landmark. So the measurement is range and The notation is phi, range and bearing. It's a two by one vector. The state is a three by one vector. Now, of course, you know by now that the state is actually on SE2. If you're going to implement an invariant extended common filter, you will look into SE2. But if you want to implement a traditional extended Kalman filter or unscented Kalman filter, you can work with X, Y, and heading, theta angle. But you need to be careful to wrap the angle between minus pi and pi whenever you take angular differences or adding angles. You don't want it to go beyond that interval. So the Jacobian will be two by three, so that we have this linearized model. And the rest is, now I use R here, so here is Q, right? But again, you can use any naming 
that you want. So this is the familiar extended column filter correction step. So nothing is different here. So that's it. You, when you have the measurements and you know how the robot is moving, you implement your model and then pass it to this filter, and then hopefully you can localize. Things you will need, what are they? Based on your experience so far with an extended comma filter, imagine you're actually going to implement this on the robot. It cannot be this simple. You, can, you need to read measurements. So the timing of these signals and uh, make sure there's no delay when you're reading data, or at least it's the latency is minimal, that's important. So you will need to set up a pipeline when you do the data acquisition, processing them, getting the measurement, until it's within your state estimator loop that you're processing. So that's some, these are some challenges for real-time implementations. You will need tuning based on the problem. The world, the real world is too messy that we can derive an exact noise covariance and say that's what's happening exactly in reality. That's just not possible. And you need an initial guess. That sounds like a deal breaker for the algorithm. If you don't know where you are roughly, there is a good chance the algorithm cannot track because if it's too far, you are always dealing with an inconsistent situation. All the innovations that you calculate are just so wrong. They're not adding correct information. Um, so one question about tuning or kind of selecting the noise, for example, for, for these sort of common filters. Um, if we know how the environment in which like a two-wheeled robot, like the example of the Roomba, it's going to be operating within yeah. someone's house, predictable environment in general. When you start going into highly varied or highly dynamic areas, your noise associated with your action or the noise associated with your motion can't be something where you can test out in some field work beforehand and then deploy into actual action because they're the very, it, it's too varied according to mm -hmm. There's just too much going on, too much dynamic. Um, no, the, the environment's very dynamic. Um, in those scenarios, it, are there any methods where like adaptive covariance or adaptive methods can be employed on top of the common filter, or is that something that is commonly used in field work? Okay, so your question is that if, if we're going to operate in an environment that is possibly dynamic and will affect these measurements, we won't be able to collect data and look at the data offline and come up somehow with an estimate of the covariance. Because we could tune it offline on data and then use it online. But if it's dynamic, we need some adaptation. Now that's a natural idea to adapt these measurement and motion covariances online, but it is also very challenging. There is no clean method that I point you to that. There are recent work, so it falls into the research area. There's a, so there are some recent works that they use deep learning to estimate these covariances. Now this is an old idea, it's not new. Based on motion modes, we would like to change motion models. We would like to tune these parameters online. The question is how to do it. One recent idea is use some computational frameworks like deep learning that can create some sort of memory and we can leverage a lot of history to correlate what we see with something we've seen in the past. Therefore, we infer some covariance that hopefully will be good. Now, there is no guarantee. These are just um, engineering ideas. So it will be a challenge. And if you're building a product, that will be your, your challenge as an engineer. Based on what you just said, um, if you're already using deep learning, 
so why do you, uh, or like machine learning, so why do we, well, so why would you bother using the Kalman filter when not just use machine learning itself to infer your state? And then my second question is, for the Kalman filter, right, so one, one drawback of that is that you need at least some reasonable initial guess, right? So my question is, is it all practiced that you would say um, implement a particle filter for like initialization um, a calibration and then to develop an initial guess and then switch to um, a Kalman filter for the rest of execution because it's more mm -hmm. um, uh, time efficient. Yeah. So your first question is that if deep learning can recover the covariances, maybe deep learning can also recover the pose, then what's the point of using a common filter? I can answer this many ways, but I guess the, the most straightforward is that please do it. When it's available, we will forget about this, right? So that's, that's the reality, because if you come up with algorithm and it's online and people can download it on the robot and it just works, of course, everybody will use that. So somebody has to get it done. If it only works for your example and it doesn't work for somebody else, that's a problem. How much effort we will need to put in to get it working? Now, it's not impossible because deep learning is also ultimately, it's another framework for inference. It, it takes data, it will give you some estimate. So in a sense, it's a nonlinear, more general versions of this. It doesn't possess any you know, nice properties in linear cases that we have, because those, there are guarantees. But we are dealing with nonlinear cases at this point. However, there is an invariant extended common filter that it does have convergence guarantee for the deterministic case of these problems. So then, there is a problem that we know how to solve it exactly. And now you're proposing that I have a method that potentially can solve it. There's no guarantee, but probably will work. So it's a battle, right? It's an ongoing debate. Now you can solve visual odometry these days with even self-supervised deep learning. It's very helpful for tracking. You can, one application that I like is, imagine you have a neural network, something like trained encoders on ImageNet, data set. You're trained on a lot of images and you have really good features. And you fine tune it in an environment such as this building so when you see one or a sequence of images, you know where you are globally. That can create a global, G, uh, an indoor GPS for you, right? That's very attractive. The problem is that at the moment, the best we could do is that it's supervised. So you do need some data collection and label for images that you need, you see, to know the pose, then you can solve it. So the problem with learning is that it's only attractive and scalable if it's generalizable and if it can be done in a self-supervised way. Besides, the moment you can do something like learning, I can use it within one, one of these filters to make it better. So it's not, contrary to what a lot of people think, it's not necessarily replacing anything here. It's just improving your signal processing part. So the way I see deep learning is, is a signal processing module. This is after that. We're dealing with measurements. So deep learning can provide measurements and give you better signal processing algorithms. Imagine you can track with relative pose. Well, that solves the problem of a motion model. And your motion model is somewhat linear in the sense of exponential coordinates because you're just directly getting delta pose. 
It is that constant velocity motion model. So that's, that's good. And you're, imagine your global position and indoor also telling you where you are each time. Well, my measurements are also directly observing my state. So an, an, an invariant extended Kalman filter can easily use that data if they're consistent to give you a very nice estimate with covariance, with uncertainty. Because getting the uncertainty out of deep learning is a problem too. There are methods to do it, but again, it's, it's, it's just too hard. You need somebody who spends five years and become an expert so that person can solve the problem. That's not a good way to train a lot of engineers. So that's answer to question one. Just think about it more in a complementary way, not in a radical way that one will replace the other one. Usually that's not the case. The second question, can we run a particle filter? Yes, that's, we're gonna talk about that. Can we combine them? Yes, we can. You can come up with a lot of ideas in practice to make them better. We're talking about the canonical basic cases here. So here an example of Kalman filter, extended Kalman filter. The visualization that you see is just visualizing contribution of different terms for you. If it helps some people to see each part as an independent covariance. So at time step t minus one, we are here with some covariance at time step t minus one. Then the robot moves to a predicted state at this location and orientation. And you can see that different terms will contribute differently. Ultimately, we get this propagated covariance. This is now bigger because as we move, the covariance gets only propagated because we're injecting noise from the motion. So that's the idea of prediction step. The rest is just talking about different tuning of alpha values, of course, will give you different outputs. So this is what's going on in the prediction step. So if you only keep predicting, because there is no rule that says that you can only predict once and then correct once. It, all, it also depends on the frequency you're observing data. So we can relate to this idea that Obviously, if you just keep predicting, you're gonna get lost at some point. The uncertainty will become too large at, this, at some point. So it's always good to have measurements for correction at a reasonably high frequency with respect to your desired accuracy. Now, when you get observations, There are two cases, one is the range variance is large, bearing is small, the range is small, bearing is small. So we are at the predicted state here with some covariance. This is the real robot. The sensor, now the nice thing about the sensor is that of course it's attached to the real robot. So the relative measurements are causal. They match the reality. So we get this measurement Z. This is covariance, predicted covariance. Now when we correct, this is an X, Y, this is an R and bearing. In the measurement space, we can talk about the innovation and innovation covariance. Remember, the innovation was the difference between measurement and predicted measurement. Or in this case, it's nonlinear.
So then we get this value because here we have z hat. And then maybe here we have z. And s, now again, you have different contributions from different terms, but ultimately you have an innovation covariance. So the innovation process is a normal distribution that zero mean with the covariance that is the innovation covariance. Or you can say my measurement is distributed centered around the predicted measurement and with covariance S. Same thing. So this is what we're dealing with in the correction step. So the larger the the, this innovation covariance, when you invert it, it will become smaller. The smaller is the filter gain. Because the Kalman gain is predicted sigma H transpose S inverse. With the first part, this is cross covariance between the state and the measurement as we derived it in the linear case. And S inverse is the precision or information matrix from the innovation process. If it's large, that means the noise in the measurement is large. We are also very uncertain about where we are. When you invert it, it becomes a small. So the filter gains is a small because we do not trust this measurement a lot. So it takes a long time to correct the state. So small innovation covariance, large filter gain. So when we run the correction, we first we were here, and then we do correction, and maybe we move closer to the real robot. That's the idea, right? And this is happening at, online at, at very recursively at very usually very high frequency. Now, let's say the robot starts from here. The dashed line is the ground truth, is the true robot. The solid line with a white circle is our estimate. And at any time, the robot might observe some landmarks. So the robot is moving, we're predicting, and then we are observing landmarks and correcting. If you visualize this sequence of localization, you will see something like this figure. So we're tracking, we're not solving global localization. If roughly we know where we are, we can track the robot using an extended common filter. Now if you see enough landmarks, you can track the global localization. So it's not that reckoning, it's not relative. But again, knowing where we are roughly initially. It's not that reckoning because we see landmarks that are fixed in the environment globally. Right? If I know two, three, la three landmarks, I can triangle it. But this filter is doing that recursively for us. Right, so the light ellipses are predicted covariance at any time. 
and the dark ones are after correction. So this is an example when the sensor observations are accurate, right? It matters what is the sensor noise covariance. And I mean it matters not necessarily in your code. It matters what for the actual sensor. Is it an accurate hardware that you're using to process and the algorithm together with the hardware to give you measurements or not? Because what you tune, you're tuning to match that. Not that whatever you tune, it makes the hardware better. If it's less accurate, it's only reasonable that after correction, right, the innovation, again, covariance will be larger, the filter gain will be smaller. When the filter gain is smaller, the corrected covariance is also shrinks less, so it remains larger. If you get more measurements, then you can, maybe you can shrink it to the desired accuracy. So that goes back to that homework, that maybe you have a sensor that is less accurate, but it operates at a higher frequency, at a given delta t. And then maybe you can get a better estimate with a consistent algorithm. So there's a trade, trade off. Now, what is the, yeah, of course, you can compare it with a ground truth if you're designing your algorithm to make sure it's working. In real applications, we don't know, of course, the ground truth. If we knew it, we didn't need this algorithm to begin with. But when you design your method, you need some sort of benchmark and ground truth to make sure it's working. Now, what's the, Accuracy we can target for the localization. What is the right accuracy error level for localization? Zero. I like your optimism, but that does not exist in real world. Anything more practical for engineers like me? Exactly. It depends on the application. You, you, there's no need to make a universal localizer with micro precision accuracy. So see the requirements, your application, and see what level of accuracy is good. Sometimes one meter error is not too bad. If it's enough to know you roughly where you are. Sometimes one millimeter is, is, is too much. So it depends what you want to do. Now we can do the exact same process with UKF. The algorithm is exactly what we talked about. Because the noise multiplicative, now you know that we should augment the state, then propagate the sigma points. So the UK, UKF part, unscented Kalman filter part, is the same. We just augment the state with zero vectors because noise is zero mean. And when we generate sigma points, we also sample from the noise by creating a block diagonal covariance of the state and the noise. These are square root notation. This is your Cholesky key factor. So in the prediction, we generate the sigma points, and then we calculate the weighted sample mean and weighted sample covariance. In the correction step, we generate the sigma point to predict the measurements. 
and calculate the innovation covariance, the cross covariance, and run the correction exactly as we had in the unscented Kalman filter algorithm. So again, this is an application of this filter to this problem. Now for seeing what's going on, in the unscented Kalman filter, we use the idea of the unscented transform for uncertainty propagation as opposed to linearization using Taylor expansion and analytical method. We have deterministic samples that are, are sigma points. Depending on that tunable parameters, you choose different sigma points based on columns of your scale Cholesky factor. So when you predict, you have basically mu t minus one and your covariance at time t minus one. The prediction will give you a new covariance as the output of the uncentered transform. With different parameters and different inputs, it can take any shape, of course. The correction step is also similar. Because we generate sigma points to predict the measurement, we can talk about these samples in the measurement space. Then we can also talk about innovation covariance, predicted measurement, maybe the real measurement, Then we run the correction, and hopefully the covariance will get smaller, and then we get closer to the true pose. So that's what we're hoping to get here. So compared to the extended column filter, there are less individual terms to look at because it's, it's a sampling-based method. You draw a deterministic sample, and you get weighted sample, weighted mean and weighted sample mean and sample covariance. Now you can solve the same problem. If the setup is basic, probably you get the same answer. Maybe UKF works better in some cases, but a lot of time you might get similar results. But it is attractive that it is derivative free. You don't need to derive the Jacobians. Now this goes back to the topic of predicting the covariance. Of course, none of these two can model that exponential banana shape covariance. Only we can do it in the exponential coordinates. Now in your homework on localization, it is based on robot operating system. So you will run a simulated map with some landmarks. You will implement, we give you the setup. You will fill in the algorithms for extended Kalman filter, unscented Kalman filter, invariant extended Kalman filter, and particle filter. So you get to implement all of them and compare them. So the lesson also is that once you learn a set of tools, you can apply it to many problems. Localization is one of them. It's very important, we're covering it. But once you do research or work somewhere, see if the problem setup uh, is reasonable for a tool that you know. Then probably you can apply that tool. As opposed to mixing the tool with the setup of the problem to come up 
with a complicated algorithm that is tied to that particular problem. That makes it confusing because what are the other options, right? Whereas this way you can just change the tool and see what you get. All right, we're gonna talk about particle filter now. Now you might expect this to be a better choice, and it is, because it is multimodal. It can track multiple hypotheses at the same time. This is the filter that can solve the global localization problem. This is just a cartoon with some visualization to see what's going on with some useful sequence of getting measurements, prediction, running motion prediction, and resampling. So initially, let's say we live in this one-dimensional world, just like your circular world example in your homework one or two. Anybody remembers? <laughs> Nobody remembers. <laughs> You never look back. <laughs> you, as soon as you press submit, <laughs> I'm done with this. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. It gets more fun when we move forward. Always basic parts are harder. When you go to actual problems, it gets fun. But you can have more fun if you know, you have fair knowledge of basic ideas because then you can get creative. Like somebody was saying, can I mix invariant EKF and particle filter or EKF and particle filter? Yes, because he knows both of them. Now he comes up with an idea that to get best of both for this problem. So initially we don't know where we are. A reasonable choice here to start with a uniform distribution. So I'm just gonna randomly spread the particles. These, these are particles. One, the localization problem. So the ro robot only moves along this S axis. There are three doors. Somehow the robot can detect the door. There is a sensor that will tell you there's a door, and that's our measurement. And we can somehow know when the robot moves to have a motion model for that. So let's say first we get a measurement. We are next to a door. This will raise the probability, the weight of all the particles that are near these doors, because when, for each particle, we go and calculate the predicted measurement, which we're assuming there is a way for each particle, somehow you predict based on the map that is given to you, where is the door? Now that can be just a distance, right? You have a map, you just know the distance to the door, the sensor is telling you another distance, you get the delta. So this will give you the innovation, right? Z minus Z hat. And this is a normal distribution with zero mean and some covariance, I don't know, R. Now, one thing is that in Kalman filter, this is the innovation process. In particle filter, of course, we don't calculate that innovation. So we go with the Sensor noise covariance. It resembles that, that innovation process, but we don't have the full innovation covariance. However, we can tune this. In particle filter, it is always better to use noise parameters that are larger than the actual noise values because you wanna let the filter to explore a little more, not to collapse into some 
a few single points. So it's, it's a better idea to use larger noise values than you would use for a Kalman filter. In any case, we run the update because we, we received the measurement that raises the weight for these particles because they're close to a door. And clearly we cannot distinguish three doors. They look the same to us. That's why we raised the weight for all three. Now in this case, two things can happen. If you run prediction, what happens the prediction acts like a convolution. This integral will shift everything forward based on your model, which moves everything one delta forward. This is here now. And then if you do resampling, Remember, if you remember, after resampling, we normalize the weights. We have a fresh start, so all the weights are equal now. But we have more mass at these three points. So see how mo the motion is helping us to recover the position next time. Without the motion, we would not be able to distinguish between three doors. Now, if you get another correction, what happens at the other two very likely hypotheses, there is no door. So the particles are, that are located at the other two denser part of the histogram that we're showing here, they're not going to get higher weights. There's one of them that is still close to a door. So two observation and one motion in between now help, help us to globally recover the location of the robot. So we just solved the global localization problem. We didn't know where the robot is located initially. Now, of course, some particles will get higher weights, but that's nowhere near the mass that is gathered in near the second door. And then maybe you move again, and then do resampling, and now we're tracking the robot. Somehow we need to extract the robot poles. You might get the sample mean of all particles. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Maybe you do clustering, and then work with the cluster that has the higher number of particles. There are different ideas how to extract the robot pose. The simplest one is just take the mean, sample mean. So the question is why every time we get a measurement, the likelihood model, probability of observation given the state, is giving us peaks around three doors. Because there is a data association ambiguity here. In this problem, we don't know the ID for doors. But we have the map. The map is known. But we don't know the ID for the door. If you knew the ID of the door, you, you, you're done first time you observe the door. That's a much nicer problem. So, you don't know the ID, right? Huh? <laughs> if these two doors, they're not exactly identical, but let's say they're identical, how do you know this is door number one, <laughs> that's door number two? Especially that you're observing them relatively. You don't know your global heading and location. That's why. So can we say the sensing models give us the global sensor for all that? Then we use 
this kind of measurement of localized like that? Yeah, you can think about it like that mark of localization when there was a grid of likelihood to combine with the belief over your grid world, right? Or you can think about it this way. Imagine for every point here, I go ahead and evaluate this probability, which is a normal distribution with mean and some covariance. This is the output of that PDF. When you evaluate the probability density function, it will give you a likelihood value. If you do it for every single point, it will be peaked around, you get Gaussians around the doors. Any, anywhere else, the distance probably is too large depending on what covariance you choose. In this case, a variance because it's one dimensional. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. However, this is as we talked in the mark of localization and particle filtering lectures, the mark of localization was this just the introduction of the base filter for grid world. It is very memory inefficient. We don't want to go ahead and evaluate the likelihood for every single point in the state. If this is 2D, this is already too large. If it's 3D, that's just impossible. You're gonna spend all your computation on just evaluating the likelihood model. So what we want to do, we want to evaluate it at places when we place hypothesis, and that's what the particle filter does. It is memory efficient in the sense that it tracks a fixed set of hypotheses as opposed to evaluating our hypothesis for every grid in the world. This is an example of global localization from probabilistic robotics book. Imagine this is, I think this is a, maybe a museum map. It's also somewhat symmetric about this axis. So initially, they're just populating the map. This is an occupancy grid map. It's given to us. This is free. This gray area may be occupied, unknown. Later in the mapping lecture, we will learn how to build these maps, but for now, the map is given. We populate the map, maybe uniformly with particles. Now, we know that in the motion model phase of the particle filter, we sample from the noise and then we evaluate the motion model for each particle that will respect the model or the sensor data we have, whether that's odometry from encoders, from IMU, or anything else. But also, it do it so in a stochastic way. It draw a sample from noise, and then that generates a hypothesis with the way it moves the particle. But it, don't, it doesn't move them you know, uniformly or too random. They will be centered around the way the robot moves, and that's usually better. In any case, as the robot moves, the particles will spread out. They get propagated. Um, why is the red dot in the previous slide? In the, the red dots are, these are particles. We need to initialize 
somewhat uniformly in the places that the robot can be. Now, although you see some here, but the robot cannot be here and cannot be here, but it can be here. So we place hypothesis in three grids of the map. Right, the heading is also possibly they have different headings, right? It's not like. Yeah. It, here is 2D, it's easy. You can just draw some random heading from between 0 and 360 minus pi pi. If you want to do it on SE3, that you can. Then you draw noise in the Lie algebra. Then you take the exponential map, and then you integrate based on the integration rule, which is imagine the pose is in SE2, and you read some velocity from which is the body velocity in um, the body frame moving forward and turning from your real encoder. This is in the Lie algebra. Then you can say that my motion model is like this. This is what you, W is some zero mean white Gaussian noise. So you draw noise and perturb this input. Then you take the exponential map. This will cause the particle to, now in it, if you visualize it, you can't get the banana shape. It can become curved because you take the exponential. But in the Lie algebra, It's just the vector, three vector. You'd have to take the wedge here before adding it. That's how we can have this type of models with Lie group integrated into the particle filter. You can do the same thing with IMU inside the particle filter. So it's pretty straightforward, it's not. You don't seem to agree <laughs> completely with me. <laughs> Where is the disagreement? I'm just thinking about uh, spreading this around in circles. Maybe this still makes sense. Yeah. Like now, it gets complicated when you go to 3D. Maybe for 2D, I think you can do that. It's not a problem. I think, especially for a 2D localization in particle filter, that's not a problem. You can just draw noise for the angle. The SO3, this is more principled. In a sense, it's easier. With IMU, definitely you want to use the model for the IMU because that the sensor is best model with that, as far as we know. Now, you might have some proximity sensor or range finders. This is infrared beam that measures time of flight to an obstacle, and it gives you a range, distance to an obstacle. Now, if you collect data, you do get something like this that Initially, it, it behaves like an exponential distribution, roughly. Then there's a Gaussian part. There's also some you know, uniform part noise. And then you have the maximum range distribution. 
You can talk about, as you can read it in chapter six of probabilistic robotics book, you can talk about a mixture model for the range finder sensors, then you can collect data, optimize and estimate these parameters, or you can just use a Gaussian in practice and tune the parameters. And that's what I would do. If it doesn't work, then think about something more complicated. If it works, just take your money and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so sonar uses sound, acoustic signals. You, it's not as accurate as laser, light, using light for measuring range. And the consequence of that is that the Gaussian that you get from ultrasound signals, it's more spread out. The distribution is wider. Now when you can use ultrasound acoustic signals and you cannot use laser, can you think of an example? It's underwater navigation. It's light. It's underwater navigation, perfect. Because the infrared uh, portion of light will get absorbed very quickly underwater. And current sensors that we have, they operate based on the infrared range of the light. There were some ideas using blue parts of light for underwater LIDAR, but I am not sure if there is a, there's a sensor that we can purchase at this point. But there are ideas people work on how to build near sensors that they work in different environments. So sonars are very useful for underwater navigation. In con contrast to laser, sound signals can propagate in any medium, as long as there is a medium. So it, they work underwater. There are many water drops rates across the environment. Would the lighthouse detection speed or laser sensors would be affected? In, you mean in what type of environment you, you said? Foggy. 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 Yeah. No, that's, that's a problem. So if, if you're operating, it, let's say self driving car is operating in a snowy, foggy, rainy, the LiDAR measurements can include many artifacts, they can be reflected. There are a lot of problems. There was a PhD thesis here in Michigan. The work, part of the work was about removing outliers caused by snow in LiDAR measurements for self-driving cars. So there are many challenges and they're just research problems people work on. But it is a problem. If it's foggy, LiDAR might not be very good. Camera obviously cannot detect the long range. What can we do? Radar. Radar can penetrate into fog. But they're different, right? It's not like it's gonna replace LiDAR. Radar points are very sparse compared to LiDAR. So it makes sense to have radar on self-driving cars. That's why some of them, they, they do include them. There are some radars that are ground penetrating radar. There are some slam work in that area as well from CMU, from Professor Michael Case group. I saw ground penetrating radar work in a slam. Those are very interesting too. So a lot to explore here, but we're talking about a simple range find finder, no fog, no snow. We're inside the museum. People may walk, so there's some randomness, but as long as we're not surrounded by people corrupting all the measurements, we have fair amount of robustness to small motions in the environment. 
given that we know the map. And we re-observe a lot of areas again. So we initialize. The range finder is detecting maybe with 100, 300, 500 beams around the robot with some fixed resolution. The laser shoots this beam and measures the distance. This will give us range and bearing because relative to where the sensor is attached on the robot, a single beam has a fixed angle relative to the robot body frame, sensor frame. So we measure the range, we know the angle for that beam, then we get range and bearing measurement. These blue lights, so some of them, they will hit the max range. Some of them will hit the obstacles. And some of them will go through the wall. Probably there was a glass. The laser can go through the glass, anything transparent, you're just not going to observe that as, as an obstacle. That's a problem, too. So we get the measurements. So for every measurement, we need to predict the range. How do we predict the range? So given the particle position, so every particle is a hypothesis of the robot pose. We do ray tracing. We know the sensor model. We know how many beams we have. Now you might choose to use all of them or maybe a subset of them. We ray trace in the map that we know until we hit an obstacle. This will give me a predicted measurement for maybe an actual measurement here. Then I can evaluate a PDF like this. or the range. Now maybe I do this for bearing as well and multiply them. Or maybe you make it multivariate. Some freedom to how to model this. So you need a, you can predict the measurement and then you do it for all the weights. You assume maybe each beam is independent, so that overall likelihood is the product of all of them. So now you have a likelihood for the entire scan. Then we can run the importance sampling in part of the particle filter. We can add, update the weights. So this is the observation part. At this point, the particles do not have similar weights. Once we run the resampling, the particles will ha will, with higher weights will be replicated. Then we move. We observe something again. We repeat the process. Another resampling. Now, there's a good chance the robot is here at this point. But maybe he's here, too. And there are some other particles around. And that's not a bad thing. You want to keep some particles around. You don't want, you, you don't want it to immediately collapse into a single particle, as long as you can track a fair amount of mass around where the actual robot is. You want some particles to be spread around. So you can solve that kidnap robot problem. If you move the robot, if some particles are exploring and not, they're not around where, you, where the robot is actually is, when you move the robot, then maybe those particles can get higher weights and you can recover. That's how you can solve the kidnapped robot problem. By letting some of the, some, maybe a smaller portion of particles to explore and not just be allocated to track the robot. 
So we solve the global localization problem. From here, usually we can track. The particle filter will track it for you. But you can switch to a Kalman filter if you want. But there is a problem of getting lost again as well. Let me see if I understand. Particle filters are determinist, deterministic. Oh, so you mean if we want to recover the robot pose, visually we can see it, but that doesn't mean we actually have a number. Right, we can get the first, we have a set of samples, we, we can get the, <coughs> excuse me, sample mean, be careful if it's an angle, make sure you wrap it. You can also get sample covariance. You can get higher moments as well if you know what to do with them. What sort of application we can use higher moments? I don't know any specific application that you can use higher moments. That is an algorithm that we frequently implement. But I do know that there are some recent advances that we can up to an arbitrary moment with certain class of nonlinear um, functions, we can propagate the distribution exactly using solving uh, semi-definite programming. Now, one idea that we had, we, it's not done, but one idea was that what is the generalization of a Kalman filter? If you have two moments, if I have a filter that I can up to 10 moments, 20 moments, whatever you choose, I can do prediction exactly and correction. That's a new filter. We haven't done it. I don't know if it'll, it will work better or not. But it is a research idea because the higher you go, you can capture the nonlinearity. The Gaussianity is, is the standard because this is symmetric, no skewness. The third moment will model the skewness. So if you manage to model higher order moments, then you can capture multimodal distributions as well. There are some work that you can recover modes of a distribution by again solving a semi-definite program. If you're interested, I can share some uh, papers with you. Or maybe you're the one you want to solve it. Then give me a call. <laughs> So measurements, again, weight update, resampling. We're tracking at this point, right? It's localized. And everybody is happy. So this is an algorithm that actually works very well in practice. This is the gold standard of robot localization for this type of setup, 2D. It's Simple to implement, it works really well in practice. So that's why particle filters are so popular for localization. This robot is keep going. <laughs> so 
Sounds like that part of your filter can solve this problem here easily. Now, one problem on this uh, robot dog was that the processor was super weak. It wasn't like this is a smart one. This is a monster now. <laughs> the processor was really, really weak. It, it, just running a particle filter or running a computer vision algorithm and a particle filter could easily consume all your resources. So it wasn't that easy, as easy as just knowing the algorithm and knowing what to do, you solve the problem. Today, that's not a problem because I think this type of algorithms, you can easily run it on a smartphone or a small embedded computer. And that's what makes them interesting because compared to something like deep neural network, even if the ne neural network can solve it, you need a GPU. We can run this on small processors. They're cheap. They reduce the cost of building a product. So they are still very attractive because you can run them on virtually any computer without demanding computational resources. What about the goals? Do you think, what should we do so we don't score on goals? At some point, they made the, they removed the color of the goals. Every year, the problem would become more complicated. So about the time that I was, you know, about to leave, then the last year or so was that both goals are now white, just like a regular goalpost for the now robots, walking platforms. Then it, you had a chance to win because some teams could score on goals more than you do. <laughs> Sometimes that's how you win. And you get the certificate. <laughs> and that's your achievement. <laughs> So, there are a lot of ups and downs in life. <laughs> to summarize, so now you should have, you have a question? Which for sigma covers the whole map, for example. If your initial covariance is large enough, it may work. So the question is what happens if the initialization is very far from where the robot is? Can a large initial covariance help to help recovering the pose? Maybe, maybe not. The idea is that if the initial covariance is large enough to include the ground truth, there is a good chance we can recover it. The reason I say maybe because, now maybe this map is a small, maybe it works here, but generally that's not an idea to recommend because how large do you want to make the covariance? Infinite? So it's not very practical. In larger scale domains, outdoor, that's not very practical. If the initial covariance, however, is tight, most certainly we won't be able to recover, or it takes a long time to eventually recover, and a lot of estimates along the way are just not correct because the filter is overconfident, we're just nowhere near the actual pose, right? So depending on the situation, we might, it might work. So these problems are, now we have discussed properties of particle filters. It summarizes that as well. But this problem of 2D localization is low dimensional. If you go to 3D and, and problems that are high, higher dimensional, it becomes inefficient to draw samples and do these particle propagations as well. So that is a challenge, that's why a lot of 
today's SLAM methods in 3D, they use optimization. Because optimization, just like that column filtering, it is basically single hypothesis. You solve the least squares, you get a point estimate. You get just mean value. Maybe you do some approximation using the Hessian and you recover the covariance as well, but that's about it. Just to give you an example, IMU, how many samples do you need to draw? The inputs you have, you have the noisy acceleration, you have the noisy gyro data, that's already six. Maybe you have the bias for acceleration two, or maybe you have the bias for gyro two. That's 12 now. So, will this work? It will work, but you should see, depending on the problem, how many particles you need to use until you can solve the problem. So that some groups in the final project ha have this idea to use particle filter and IMU within the context of a slam, and that's a good idea to explore. Now, one idea that I can help you with that is called, in the broader class of inference, it's called Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's not sequential. One idea for drawing samples more efficiently is called Gibbs sampling. So what you do, you make it conditional sampling. First, maybe you sample from one block of the input. You fix that, and then you sample from the other one. This way, you condition the part of the state and the other part and makes it more interesting because you don't have to throw away all the samples. Gibbs sampling allows us to um, keep all the samples. Otherwise, you have to reject some of the samples in the context of Monte Carlo sampling. Can you repeat again? What, what sampling is this? Gibbs sampling. So this is something that we should discuss outside of the lecture for your project it might come handy if you're working in this problem. Not related to this localization. So it might, the problem might become higher dimensional, and then as you explore, you're just wasting a lot of resources for randomly walking around. And if you are dealing with a 2D localization, please use this. It's pretty good and usually solves your problem. The question is, what do I mean by non-parametric filter? Because we track a bunch of samples, a histogram of the posterior, we do not have a parametric model. Like column and filter, we have this mean and sigma. Our goal is to estimate these parameters. In particle filter, there is no such a thing. The relationship between observations, the inputs, data, and the outputs are modeled statistically using a set of samples. That's, that's why we call it non-parametric. When you have some sort of parameters to describe that relationship, then it's parametric. Can you repeat? The question is, don't we use parameters from the measurement model of the particle filters? It's about the posterior. It's not about the parameters. Of course, you have parameters for a lot of places. It depends how you characterize the posterior, right? All non-parametric mo model models also have parameters. Usually, we call them hyperparameters because they're not the parameters that are describing the posterior but maybe some aspects like the measurement noise, maybe. 
So when you t hear the term hyperparameters, they refer to that type of parameters. Is that because the particle filter already uses? No, Gibbs sampling is for MCMC. I am giving you MCMC example codes. It's on Canvas. It's not related to particle filter. This is something that I can teach you outside of the lecture. It's not really the topic of the class. But I think we can leverage this idea in your particle filter slam using IMU if some groups are going that way. Just a suggestion. So I'm gonna end the lecture because that's the end of the time. And I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>